I want to start by asking you a question. How can liquids behave like an ionized gas plasma? Okay. The answer, I think, is that plasma behavior depends on the motion of charged particles, which are free to move in response to electromagnetic forces. So if a liquid is partially ionized, then the charged particles in the liquid ought to experience similar forces, and the liquid will behave sort of similarly to the ionized particles in the gas. So, what we're going to do is to look at three examples of partially ionized liquids and compare their behavior to plasma behavior in space. So, the structure of the talk, first of all, we'll examine the floating water bridge, <coughs> excuse me, and the various attempts to explain it without using plasma behavior. Then we'll compare it to the way plasma behaves in space. We'll find that some of the puzzling features of the floating water bridge can be explained by using plasma behavior. In the second half of the talk, we'll then use the same plasma behavior and Professor Pollock's easy layers in water to offer an explanation of unusual fluid flows in plant roots and blood vessels. So we're starting off with the floating water bridge. Now, you've already seen this a couple of times already, courtesy of Professor Pollock and Elmar Fuchs, who made the film. So the floating water bridge forms between two beakers of pure water when a large potential difference of about 15,000 volts or above is applied between them. And here you can see two features of the bridge. There's a nearly cylindrical tube of water, one to two millimeters in diameter, between the beakers. And the tube can be stretched up to about 25 millimeters long. And the bridge is like a tightrope. It doesn't sag as you'd expect it to under its own weight, even when it's stretched out to 25 millimeters. Now this film, also by Almar Fuchs, shows that the water is rotating. The film's in slow motion because the rotation is actually too fast to see with the naked eye. So Fuchs has shown that water in the bridge is separated into an annulus and an inner core. And the circular annulus is the part that's rotating. In laser light, shone in from the end of the bridge, you can see that the light is curving around the rotating annulus part and avoiding the core in the middle. So it gives you some indication of that shape I'm talking about. Now Fuchs also found that the annulus and core each carry water along the bridge, but in opposite directions. So that's quite extraordinary, really. Water is flowing in both directions at the same time. Now, not only water, but charge flows across the bridge as well. Now, charge flowing in opposite directions is an electric current. By using pH dyes, Fuchs has shown that the bridge transports charge or current from one beaker to the other. And here we can see charge regions adjacent to the terminals boiling off, as it were, charge during an experiment. And at the end of the experiment, you can see the difference in pH in the beakers. Now Armstrong, back in 1893, who was the guy who first discovered the floating water bridge, the experiment was then forgotten for about 100 years, Armstrong found that the annulus is positively charged and the core is negative. So there we can see how we can get a current flowing across the bridge. Positive charge in one direction and negative charge in the other is equivalent to a current in one direction. So to summarize, a floating water bridge is a stiff cylindrical tube with an annulus and core structure. There's simultaneous bidirectional flow of water and charge across the bridge, and the annulus is rotating very fast around the core. What's more, the annulus is positive and the core is negative. So researchers have approached the analysis of the floating water bridge from both the classical and the quantum directions. The principle of the classic EHD approach is that electric stress causes the axial tension in the bridge. According to Taylor, electrodynamic currents are assumed to be so small that magnetic induction effects can be ignored. Bertram and Saville expanded on Taylor's analysis, but without achieving complete success. They stated, although the quantitative agreement between theory and experiment is not as close as one might like, Using surface transport as an adjustable parameter brings them into agreement. Sounds great, doesn't it? 
But the problem with that is that the adjustable parameter is completely arbitrary. It's values chosen to make the equations work. It's not a measured value from the experiment. Well, of course you can make it work if you can choose any value you like. So there's something missing. Widem analyzed the water bridge in terms of the Maxwell pressure tensor in a dielectric fluid. He assumed deionized water throughout because the need for deionized water is evidently necessary to prevent conductivity effects from masking the insulating dielectric effects. In other words, his analysis only worked with a dielectric. But the presence of charge in the beakers after an experiment shows that the water does become partially ionized. This obviously casts doubt on Widem's analysis. So what's missing? What's missing from the analysis is that they don't account for the annulus and core structure, or the bidirectional flow, or the fast rotation of the annulus. Now I suggest that these may introduce additional electromagnetic effects which haven't been taken into account, because as we know, the water is charged. We'll therefore compare the floating water bridge with another filamentary structure in which electromagnetic effects dominate the behavior. Here's a picture of plasma behavior in space. Excuse me a moment. Now, Rogoff and others have de uh, described plasma as the fourth state of matter. The other three, of course, are solids, liquids, and gases. Plasmas are estimated to constitute over 99% of the visible universe. And plasma, as you all know, is often described as an ionized gas. But as Alfen said, Whilst this is technically true, it doesn't reflect the complexity of the behaviour of plasma under the influence of electromagnetic forces. Normal gases simply can't do what a plasma does. Plasma can transmit an electric current in a defined filament without affecting the surrounding plasma, as we see here in the Cygnus loop. The plasma rearranges itself to form what is effectively an insulated cable around the current path. And so the bulk plasma, the rest of the plasma in space, isn't affected. And the way it does this is by forming a rotating cylinder of adjacent layers of positive and negative charge on the outside of the current. This filamentary arrangement is known as a Birkeland current. Now the behaviour of a Birkeland current is governed by Maxwell's equations of the Lorentz force law applied to the individual charged particles in the filament. Essentially, each and every particle has to follow the magnetic field lines where it is. But it also, by moving, it modifies the same magnetic field lines. So according to both Alphane and Parrat, the net result of this interaction is a, result, is a spiraling filamentary pattern in which the circularity of the paths of the particles is dependent on their radial distance from the central axis of the filament. So here you can see a diagram with three examples chosen at random. The further you are from the center of the current, the more, uh, rate, more circular the path you have to follow. So it's strongly helical and the outside layers. So the charged particles always follow the magnetic field line direction at their location. And this explains the alternative name for a Birkeland current as a field aligned current. The field-aligned direction is the most efficient direction for current to travel in through a magnetic field, and that's because the Lorentz force law effectively imposes an electrical resistance on motion transverse to the magnetic field. That means the resistance is lowest in the direction parallel to the magnetic field. Therefore, the current is in a force-free configuration when it's field-aligned. One other effect important here the outer paths are strongly helical, and that means that the outer layers are rotating around the axis of the filament, and that in turn generates more electromagnetic forces, and they are an essential part of the stability of the Birkeland current. So, to summarize a Birkeland current, plasma behavior means that a Birkeland current has a form of annulus and core structure. It has bidirectional flows because of current of opposite charged particles, and it also has rotation of the outer layer. That sounds a bit like the missing bits of the floating water bridge analysis.